All right. So welcome to WTF is going on in Latin America and the Caribbean, the Code Pink Latin America team's weekly webinar on important regional news that doesn't get covered in corporate media. My name is Leonardo Flores, and I'm filling in for my friend and colleague, Terry Matson, who normally hosts the show every Wednesday night at 7.30 p.m. Eastern. Tonight is, is a special episode given what's been going on in Cuba over the past week and really what's been going on in the U.S. in response to that. And I'm joined by Reed Lindsay, a documentary filmmaker and journalist with 20 years of experience reporting, investigating, writing, producing, directing, and mentoring around the world. He's the founder and currently the director of Belly, Belly of the Beast, an award-winning, innovative new media organization that covers Cuba and Cuba-U.S. relations. Welcome to the program, Reed. It's really a pleasure to have you here with us. Thanks for having me. Can you tell us a little bit about, about Belly of the Beast and, and the documentary that you all made, The War in Cuba? Sure. Belly of the Beast is uh, it's a media organization that, 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 that we started about a year ago and um, is independent uh, and we are funded by uh, donations um, through a nonprofit fiscal sponsor and we focus on coverage of Cuba and U.S.-Cuba relations um, and we uh, are a collaborative project with uh, journalists like myself from the United States and, and Cuban journalists and filmmakers. And we mainly focus on video. Uh, our aim is to reach a young audience in the United States. And we try to do so with very high quality production video uh, uh, combined with substantive journalism. I uh, try to do the counter mainstream narratives in the United States and tell stories in Cuba that are not being told um, um, to the US audience. That's great. And I really want to, I'm going to play a clip right now from a video that you just made in response to the July, or about rather, the July 11th protests. So bear with me while I screen my shirt, my screen for a second. Thousands took the streets this Sunday in the biggest protest Cuba has seen in decades. The chants focused on civil liberties and the political system, but scarcities were the biggest factor fueling the demonstrations. <laughs> U.S. sanctions, intensified during the Trump administration, triggered Cuba's economic crisis. But the protesters took their anger out on the Cuban government. The 60-year-old U.S. blockade against Cuba was created to deny money and supplies to Cuba to bring about hunger, desperation and overthrow of government. The Trump administration expanded the economic war against Cuba, strangling the island with more than 200 sanctions, like an oil blockade and restricting remittances and flights. During the pandemic, these sanctions escalated, hindering Cuba's response to COVID. Rollout of Cuba's vaccine was delayed because US sanctions prevented raw materials from being imported, according to the Cuban government. Even now, as COVID cases in Cuba rise to their highest level since the pandemic began, Joe Biden has done nothing to lift the sanctions. His response to Sunday's events did not mention the embargo. The United States stands firmly with the people of Cuba as they assert their universal rights. And we call on the government, the government of Cuba, to refrain from violence or attempts to silence the voice of the people of Cuba. No es un discurso muy hipócrita y muy cínico que tú que me bloqueas, que tú que, que, que llevas a cabo la política que viola más los derechos humanos de todo un pueblo durante más de 60 años, la recrudezcas en medio de una situación tan compleja como la pandemia y te quieras presentar como el gran salvador, levántame el bloqueo. In Miami, Cuban American hardliners have circulated a petition calling for a U.S. intervention. La intervención sea algo eh, con la comunidad internacional para proveer esos, esas ayudas o algo militar, todas las opciones tienen que estar sobre la mesa. Hundreds of government supporters took to the streets in response to the protest. La política agresiva del gobierno de los Estados Unidos y el bloqueo que todos los días se arrecia, que la administración anterior eh, tomó más de 240 medidas y por lo tanto Eso, junto con la pandemia, ha complejizado la situación del país. In Havana, the government's response to protests was mixed. In the neighborhood of Regla, protesters marched for hours peacefully without a police response. In downtown Havana, encounters with the police were frequent and violent. Cuban musician Jomil tried to convince protesters to carry out a peaceful sit-in. Esto es un momento histórico para toda nuestra comunidad, señores. Tenemos que ser inteligentes. Esto no se va a hacer. But 
His appeal was ignored. Government security forces detained dozens, possibly hundreds of protesters. Protests ended Sunday night. The streets are calm for now. First of all, that's an excellent video. I think that answers quite a bit of questions for people who really have no idea what's been going on in Cuba over the, over the last few weeks. So congratulations on that. Can, can you tell us uh, what the situation is on the ground right now? Well, the situation has been pretty calm um, in Havana, at least, since Sunday. Uh, on Monday, there was someone killed, a 36-year-old man in, um, the, uh, in Havana. And it is unclear what happened. Uh, the state media reported on that. Um, and uh, we haven't been able to, to independently sort of figure out exactly what happened there. Um, and I think that it's, it's you, we just, on state media, you get a very one-sided account. So I, I would take that with a grain of salt, not knowing the circumstances. I think the most we can say is that a person was killed uh, by the Cuban security forces and, and uh, and uh, it was on Monday, so it was the day after when there were really demonstrations. It was a localized uh, uh, event. Uh, I, I'm not positive it was a demonstration, but it could have been. And, um, uh, and that would have occurred in, uh, in Havana. Uh, that, there were no deaths on Sunday. Um, since Monday, I, there really hasn't been anything. A lot of rumors. Um, I think a lot of rumors emanating from the United States. I've had two, two anecdotes, but uh, of people, a member of the Bloody Beast team, and also a neighbor who uh, heard through family members um, of, of family members in the United States that uh, things were happening, like there was massive demonstration in the Malecon, or tanks were coming from the US, and these type of things. And, and as it turns out, it wasn't true. Stuff on the internet talking about how uh, protesters had taken over the province of Camagüey turned out not to be true. Uh, a lot of you know pictures of the on the internet of the of Alexandria and Egypt after Mubarak fell, saying that that was the Malakona Um, Lots of sort of fake news floating around. Lots of rumors. Um, I, but but like if you walk out on the streets, it's calm. I just actually an hour ago was told. That, that, that there's something brewing in the Malacone. And I, you know, we're, 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 so we hear that, do we go? Is it probably just a rumor? How do we find out? Um, the internet's been, was cut. Um, and uh, it's been a little hard initially to figure out what was going on. But now it's, it, there is an internet. We're speaking, I have Wi-Fi at my house. I'm in a very privileged situation, obviously. Um, most people don't have Wi-Fi in their homes, but uh, VPNs are readily available, and with a VPN, you can get online and access WhatsApp uh, and sell data now. And there are Wi-Fi parks um, where you can access the internet as well. So uh, it's not that difficult now to get connected. Um, but yeah, a lot of fake news going around. Um, and uh, yeah, the question now is: is will there be another sort of uh, uh, protest like there was on Sunday, which was? On the scope of it, when compared to protests in other parts of the world, certainly I've covered a lot of protests around the world, including the United States, and uh, it was relatively small. Um, at least what I, I went to two, I saw two pro protests independent of each other in Havana. One was about 300 people. The other was uh, several thousand, um, but most of the city was calm. It, they were not enormous protests, but in Cuba, even a few hundred people protesting against the government is a hugely significant event because it is not normal. And, uh, and I think it is a, uh, uh, as I think maybe the video, as the video hopefully shows, is a result of a, a lot of anger and frustration that people are feeling because the economic situation is so dire here. Um, and, Can you and go it's into extended that a bit more in, in, yeah. in terms of the, what, how people are feeling like the pinch economically? Yeah, it's not like Cuba was a booming economy five years ago, like when Obama was here and opening things up. Things started to improve, especially in Havana, when, uh, in, in particular Havana, when, when, when Obama sort of opened relations. But it wasn't a booming economy, and, and people still were you know, str struggling to get by, and, um, and, and very low salaries and so on. 
and and uh, and lines to get stuff and and, and whatnot. But um, uh, when Trump took over, he intensified sanctions and things. Uh, and there was really he he had passed a barrage of sanctions, one after the next, and it made things more and more difficult. There was less uh, uh, less and less. Uh, there were fewer tourists, which took a big hit. He he basically did everything possible to cut off Cuba's access to foreign currency, and that affected everyone because um, uh, it affected the government and affected uh, the, there, were, there were energy shortages. There were um, for tourists. So, so let's say the the the, uh, the guy who uh, the, the person who owns a uh, in the war in Cuba, we interviewed a BC taxi driver whose clients weren't tourists, but his clients were Cubans who were working in the tourist industry and they made some money. So now he's out of, he basically has no work anymore. So um, things of that nature, uh, uh, but things, uh, 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 but it, and it was getting worse and worse. And, and even at that time, I, that same BC taxi driver remember telling us that things were getting worse than the special period. And it was before COVID and when COVID hit, it just, uh, it, 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 the, things went in a free fall here. Um, and, the, and the biggest thing was lines, just massive lines to get food, just food shortages, essentially. And so um, people waiting in long lines to get food, to get detergent, uh, soap or, or cooking oil, um, whatever might be there. Sometimes things that were non-essential, like uh, the, uh, cola or you know, beer as well, but just lines and lines. That, that wasn't the case before. You have to wait in line for seven hours to buy chicken. Maybe wait in line for 30 minutes, uh, or maybe not at all, but, but it, was, uh, it got really bad with the lines. Um, and recent months, it's gotten really much worse. Uh, it's, it's, it's extended to even products that would not normally be scarce, like sugar, um, coffee, extremely scarce. Um, and, and outside of food, the, the really tough thing now is medicine. You know, Cuba prides itself on free healthcare. It had a pretty remarkable healthcare system. Again, before this economic crisis, it wasn't like medicine was abundant. You could go to the pharmacy and it was sort of hit or miss, you're gonna find something. But they generally had a lot of the basics and you could, you know, it was pretty available. Medicine was, you, you could find what you wanted generally. Uh, but now, I mean, the most basic things are scarce, uh, like the equivalent of aspirin or ibuprofen and, and basic antibiotics, all, all sorts of basic medicines are scarce. Um, Cuba produces most of the medicine that it makes. It, it's done that because of the embargo so that it can be self-sufficient. So it produces, I think, 70 or 80% of the medicine, the basic, at least the, the, the basics that, that, is, that are needed. Uh, but, it, but it needs to import the raw materials to make that medicine. And um, because of the intensification of sanctions, and I think probably also in part uh, because of the just sort of general lack of foreign currency in the country, it's been harder and harder for Cuba to import those raw materials. And, and as a result, uh, there is this shortage, uh, which is pretty dire. At the same time, they have two of the top vaccines in the world in terms of efficacy, and they are, have been moving forward pretty rapidly with vaccination. Um, I was, I've been vaccinated. I got my second vaccination just a week or so ago. Um, um, from what I've been told by the government, and it seems true, uh, everybody in Havana over the age of 19, nearly everybody has had at least one dose and the whole population of Havana will be vaccinated by the end of the month, um, which is pretty remarkable given the situation. Uh, one um, thing I keep, mistake I keep hearing from the Biden administration, which is it's, an, it's, a, it's not true, and also in the media, is that Cuba is having, uh, is, it, it needs, is, is the people are on the streets because they're not getting vaccinated. That's just not true. I think part of the reason people are on the streets is because of medicine, the shortage of medicine, but it's not the shortage of vaccinations. And the protests were sparked in part by a lot of um, concern over, over the COVID crisis in Matanzas and other provinces. Things have really exploded there in recent months in terms of COVID cases. Um, uh, but, um, but I, I, uh, that I, I, I think was sort of a, a detonator and uh, maybe, and, uh, uh, because it was a huge social media campaign and it, and it just, I think it may be, uh, for people who are very frustrated and angry about all sorts of other things, it maybe was the last straw, uh, type of yeah. thing, but, um, but I'd, yeah. I'd like to get into that a bit, this, uh, SOS hashtag, hashtag SOS Cuba campaign that we saw on Twitter, because it clearly starts almost a week before the protests on the 11th. And I don't know if you've seen, I know that uh, 
Cuba's foreign ministry put out a, a statement about a report on, that they're doing on this. And there's also a, a report, uh, or rather a tweet thread by an independent analyst uh, from Spain who does a lot of really great work on covering the use of bots, uh, particularly when it relates to uh, how they're used to attack left governments or left social movements throughout Latin America. And one of the, the things they found that, you know, first of all, one of the big accounts that was retweeting something like, you know, they sent a thousand tweets between the 10th and the 11th, and they were retweeting a ha the hashtag more than five times per second. And it was a guy linked to a foundation in Argentina that receives USAID and NED money. Uh, is there any kind of, do you see any connection between between this SOS hashtag campaign and the protest that did one trigger the other? I think it's, well, I was going to say it's impossible to know. I guess it, it is, in theory, it's possible. I, I, I'd be surprised if someone's able to really get to the bottom of that. Uh, you know, I was I was in Regla, at this neighborhood, when, when the protests first started there, and and I walked around for a few hours and just observed and filmed uh, the protest and tried to figure out who was leading it. You know, like was there one leader or a couple people? Was it like a real engineered, coordinated thing? It was pretty tough to tell. And there definitely were a few people who were more vocal than the rest, but it wasn't really clear that they were sort of driving it necessarily. Um, so I was asking myself that question, you know, uh, because I had in the, that day, the day before all getting, you know, we're getting all these SOS Cuba stuff and like Mia Khalifa, por uh, porn star was uh, putting out opinions about it. And everyone was like, what's going on? It just was so bizarre and people were getting upset about it. And, and, and about, about what was going on Matanzas that had been going on for a while. And, but it just sort of reached this fervor pitch online. And I, it seemed to coincide with the protests. I think though that it may be, and I do, you know, we were actually had an interview with a Spanish investigator today, which sort of, which fell through, but we hope to talk to him and we're looking into that and, and it's very interesting. And I think it's worth looking into. At the same time, I think it's sort of, it's not the main point because I feel like Cuba was a tinderbox. That may have been the match, but if it wasn't the match, there may have been a different match. The point was that it was a tinderbox. And I think that that is the bigger story and the real story. Because I know that there's, like I myself, I'm, oh, I've spent a lot of my journalistic career looking into coups and, and, and you know, sort of machinations by the CIA. And, and I find it fascinating and important and outrageous sometimes. And I know that, and, and so I, I, I will definitely, it's something that I'm interested in looking at that. But I think the bigger story and, and the more important story is that uh, that Cuba, the things are really dire here and people are angry and frustrated. They're taking out their anger on the government and, uh, and, uh, and, they're, and the government is to blame without doubt, like any government is for many problems in its country. Uh, and Diaz-Canel, the president came out and said that essentially. <laughs> Not, not, not what I just said, but he said that he did, he did this, he said, he actually, put, and I haven't ever heard him speak so, so in such a conciliatory way, but he basically said that we haven't reached uh, the vulnerable and um, areas and, and poor areas, disadvantaged areas, he said, and, and people and, and he also the institutions haven't been sensitive enough to people's concerns and problems and so on. And, and yeah, yeah, there's a lot, but, it, but the US journalist in Cuba, reporting for US audience, um, you know, for me, the bigger issue is, is, is US sanctions and US policy, because you just can't have the most powerful country in the world trying to strangle a small neighboring country economically, doing everything in its power to just destroy its economy and think that that has a minor impact or to think it doesn't have any impact, which un unfortunately, a lot of people in Miami think and and people in cuba sadly uh i mean it's uh i have we've seen it's hard it's very difficult to see the embargo my colleague liz who works here at belly the beast is always talking about how to, it's it's so hard to see it you just don't you know the people can't see it whether well, they can see the government they can see when some you know maybe the official is a abusive or takes is a, uh, takes advantage of their power or is not responsive to their concerns or understanding uh, or they're just suffering like they don't have food and medicine uh, but you don't can't see the fact that uh, 
you know, that the government tried to buy some chemical in India and they, when they went to make the financial transaction, a bank in Panama uh, stopped, closed their account. And as a result, the shipment was delayed by three months. And that's why the medicine, you know, that's why the, the sick person isn't getting their medicine. They don't see that. Nobody sees that. Even us as journalists, and we're trying hard to get at that information. We can't even get at it most of the time. And that's the really hard thing. But but I think that, but that it's real. It's absolutely real. It's, it has a tremendous impact. And um, and really, it's going to be really hard. It's going to be impossible in Cuba to ever really know what the Cuban government really is responsible for, the problems they're responsible for, the mistakes they're making, until you get rid of the embargo, because it's all mixed together. Uh, and and, and, and uh, so it's a really uh, unfortunate uh, the, the fact that, that, in, that the sanctions still exist. I, I found it outrageous as I, I am appalled by it. And I, and I feel like uh, uh, our, our elected officials should be ashamed of themselves. It is shameful. And Joe Biden, who was elected on a platform of changing policy towards Cuba, it was a prom- campaign promise he made, should be ashamed of himself. Uh, it's his recent decision to, to, to not uh, lift remittances. It was cowardly. And it was 100% based on his uh, a political calculation of Florida, which I think is wrong, but whatever. It's based on Florida politics. Because, yeah. Because it, it's it also, to me, one of the things that we've seen over the past four years, since really the Trump administration came into office, is that just prior to that, we had all these polls and all these articles talking about the divide within the Cuban American community. Uh, particularly in for Florida, about the embargo, about the this idea of not having diplomatic relations, and poll after poll showed that more and more people were opening to lifting the embargo, to resuming this, uh, to uh, to normalizing relations, and then you know if you look at the polls now, they clearly started diverging again in the opposite direction during the Trump years, and there was very little pushback uh, from any Democrat really, uh, and so so why do you think that is? What why? why didn't the Democrats kind of capitalize on on this uh, enthusiasm? Well, I mean, Obama did, but why didn't that uh, continue? Well, I'm not. I'm probably not in the best position to answer that. I have the same question because I'm. I haven't spent much time at all in Miami. I, in fact, I haven't been there in years. But I, I get the impression, um, following it from afar, that in Miami, you've got. Um, it's almost like this whole, this Trump phenomena, which I've also sort of witnessed from afar. So I haven't been in the US for most of it, but, uh, but this just radicalization of just insane radicalization of certain people in the United States and how they've, they've turned into, they've, they've, they have these crazy ideas and they're living in these insane sort of fake news bubbles. And you see it, I grew up in Idaho, you see it in places like Idaho and Wyoming, you know, where they think climate change is not real. And I mean, they, they have insane ideas. And so I feel like Miami is a little bubble of sort of fake news insanity. And people get swept up in it and that's all they hear and that's all they believe. And, uh, and, and it just sort of took over. That's the impression I get. I mean, I heard yesterday, I saw a report yesterday, I saw footage of pro- Cuban American protesters accosting the mayor of Miami and accusing him of being soft on Cuba. The mayor of Miami just called for military invent- intervention and aerial bombardment yeah. of Cuba. Yeah. He's, he's soft, according to the, the people on the street. So you can see how the, the politicians are, you know, they, they, they don't have, most of the politicians don't have any conviction. They're, they're gonna go whichever way is politically convenient. So he's just, he's trying to appease his base. He's not even going far enough by calling an aerial bombardment. So you can just imagine Biden sitting there saying, well, I don't care about Cuba. Frankly, he doesn't really care. Like, sure, I'd like to have better relations. My wife, Jill, she went down there. She had a great time. She told, told me all about it. I'd love to go back, but you know what? It doesn't really help me politically. Could hurt me though. And Menendez is giving me a hard time in the Senate. And uh, geez, there, you know, there all these these moderate moderate slash conservative Democrats in South Florida are telling me that it, that uh, they're they're getting attacked for being communists. And I better do something about it. You know, I don't know. I'm making it up because I don't know, but I'm guessing that those type of things are happening. I don't know. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Thanks so much for your time today, Reed. Can you tell us, uh, lastly, just how people can support the great work that Belly of the Beast is doing? Oh, I appreciate that. Well, 
uh, you know, check us out, spread the word about our work. Bellyofthebeastcuba.com is our website. We mainly do video again, and we do social media posts. We also try to write articles for other publications, but we don't really have a lot of written, we don't do written content on our own website outside of like short social media posts and graphics on our on social media handles, Belly of the Beast. Uh, you, I think if you just, the best way, easiest way, bellythebeastcuba.com, you can find our social media and YouTube uh, links there, or just Google Belly of the Beast Cuba, and it should come up. And the war in Cuba is on, is it on YouTube. We've got more than a half million views, views there. And if you go to our website, there's a, if you, if you are in a position to be able to donate, we, we do depend on donations to do, to do what we do. So that, that's a way to help as well. Please do donate. It's really incredible work uh, that you all are doing there. It's uh, one of the, I mean, pretty much the only independent kind of objective voice on Cuba that I've seen in English at least. So I hope folks donate and also please go to codepink.org slash end the blockade to join our call to press Biden on lifting the Trump sanctions, on lifting the embargo and on normalizing relations with Cuba. Thanks so much again for your time, Reid. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you.